New York, and I just have to say thank you. We are so proud to be a part of this opening night, the theatrical premiere of this incredibly moving and incredibly important documentary. Before I bring up um, and welcome back to the stage the extraordinary women who brought this to us, I just want to say two things about the film side of this. As so many of you probably know, this premiere and how this film does in New York will help to set the stage. It is very much, you know, the old song that says, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. That is so true in terms of the theatrical premiere. So each and every one of you has a bit of activism around film to do from this point forward. And that is to tell all of your friends and everyone you know during the next week to see this film because it will make a difference about whether this film gets the far and wide distribution it deserves or stays with our circle. Second, I think it's important to say that it's so important, particularly for films that tell the stories of women about women and are done by women. Again, such an important reason to tell everyone to see this film. So I would like such an honor to invite these two extraordinary women up to join me on the stage. Please give them an extraordinary round of applause. And also thank you to the Film Society. Really, thank you for giving us this tremendous evening. Um, so I'm going to kick off. I know everyone probably has a lot of really burning questions for the two of them, but I wanted to kick it off with just a couple of questions. Um, and then we'll get started. The first is, would it be accurate to say that you didn't really consider yourselves activists or on reproductive rights before you started this endeavor? And it's not exactly a topic that you would expect non-activists to delve into, and you really did both feet, you know, hearts, minds, bodies into the whole thing. So tell us a little bit about what got you to this. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, I don't think we were really activists before we did this film. I mean, we both considered ourselves definitely pro-choice, but the, the film itself really came out of not like an ideology, but just out of a bunch of questions related to Dr. Tiller's assassination. I remember when he was killed, watching the news coverage and being surprised, first of all, that this was a man who was killed in a church. So thinking that this was someone who was deeply religious, but he was also the number one target of the anti-abortion movement was surprising to me. And then learning that he'd been shot once before in the 1990s, he was shot in both arms, he went back to work the next day, just thinking what kind of person would do that? It just seemed crazy to me. And then learning a little bit more about him, it became frustrating to watch the news cover him and treat him as this controversial political figure rather than as a human being. I had so many questions that weren't being answered, and I think one thing you realize, I'm sure you think about this all the time when you watch the news coverage about abortion, is that it oversimplifies things to such a great degree. It's black and white. We're in these two warring camps. We're screaming at each other. Everyone hates each other. There's no common ground. You know, that's what we're told all the time. But the reality is when you meet these patients, when you meet these doctors, their situations are so much more complex and gray and grounded in these practical, real-life decisions over what are their options and what is the best one for them. So it came from craving just a different way of looking at the abortion issue in general. But you're right, it is a tough topic. I remember when I told my mother, so my first movie is going to be about, she was just like, Lana, don't do this. <laughs> he was like a rebellious teenager. Very glad to rebel. <laughs> yeah, you have anything you want to add? No, I mean, it was very much like, you know, like Lana says, it's um, it's a kind of topic that when you bring it up at a cocktail party or something, other than the one we had right before this film, it's people are sort of like, oh, you're making a movie about late-term abortion doctors, like, and then they're like, I have to get a drink, <laughs> and <laughs> that's pretty much it. So, um, and I think in some ways, well, that was disappointing. I think it made it clear that this was something that needed to be talked about. If you see that level of sort of discomfort um, with the subject, I, I immediately felt like, well, this is going to be something that's going to be really interesting to explore and we're going to learn a lot. And not knowing, I think in a lot of ways it was just so interesting because we didn't know very much at all about the, the reasons why women sought their trimester abortion. And so the learning curve was just incredible. I'm going to do two other quick ones. Um, 
Sundance was amazing, incredibly successful premiere there. Just congratulations, really extraordinary. And now you've been all across the country and beyond. What, if anything, has really surprised you about the reaction to this film? Or if nothing surprised you, I guess I'd be surprised if that were true, but uh, you know, what, what really surprised you most about the reactions that you've gotten to the film so far? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's been, um, amazing to see, you know, we made this film pretty much for the vast majority of people who I think are in the middle on the abortion issue, um, or specifically on the third trimester abortion issue. You know, it's, it's a very small percentage even of pro-choice people who support, um, at least statistically, who support, support third trimester abortion rights. So, um, so I think it was really amazing for us to have people come up to us and say, this really, you know, I'm pro-choice, but this really made me think about this issue in a whole new way. I didn't realize what these women were going through. And then to have anti-abortion people come up to us and say the same thing, and to realize that, like, both groups were being affected in this really amazing way, and, and weren't necessarily saying, you know, I'm going to go and change my vote or something, but they were saying I have a lot more compassion and understanding of what women are going through and why these doctors are doing this work. And I think you know, one of the reasons why the doctors agreed to do the film is if they don't tell their stories, then there's just this sort of vacuum of silence which is going to be filled by the anti-abortion movement sort of vilifying them. It makes it very easy. Um, so I think it, you know, it was nice to see that people were saying, well, these are in a lot of ways like human beings just like me with families and who are incredibly dedicated to this work. And the other cool part about Sundance is just how shocked the doctors were by this. <laughs> because they really, I think one reason Martha and I were able to get a lot of the access that we did to the patients in the film was because we, we you know, were these young women, we're like a lot of the women in the film, but they all said, is this a student project you're working on? Like they just had no idea. And they'd say, no, it's not, you know, we're actually making a film. And then at the end, the, even the doctors, I remember Dr. Sella, who you just saw, said at one point, so what are you going to do with this? And we said, well, we think we're going to try to get it into a festival. And she said, you mean maybe like a small women's festival would take it? <laughs> They're like, no, we think maybe a general festival would take it. And she said, really? Do you have connections? Does your editor have connections? And so, and so then when we actually got in, they were shocked. But then just that moment where we premiered the film at Sundance and Martha and I came out and introduced the four of them, and they came out to this incredible ovation was just so powerful to think that they've gone through their lives, meeting people at parties, having to gauge, should I tell them what my job is or shouldn't I, being afraid all the time, just the way that they've carried alone so much of the time, to then have them get this rapturous reception and have people in the audience crying, coming up to them and thanking them for what they did was just the most rewarding part. And the good news is we have a mic out there. I think we'll turn it over to folks in the audience. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and then I'm going to make sure I want you to get make sure the mic gets to you before you ask your question. See one right here in the middle with the glasses. Hi. Wow, that's loud. Hi, my name is Sansara Taylor. I write for Revolution newspaper, and I work with the movement Stop Patriarchy. This summer we did a 15-state, one-month-long abortion rights freedom ride. And we went to all the states, five of them, with only one abortion clinic left in the state. We visited Dr. Carhart's clinic. We went to a number of different places. And I want to say, one of the things that struck me about the film is every single clinic we went to and everything that you show in the film, every one of these has protesters every day. Some of them are, sometimes they're under siege. Sometimes they bring a whole daycare to harass women. Um, there's all kinds of things that go on. Um, and very rarely are there people on our side out there vocally supporting, escorting, there's some of that, but actually in the streets reclaiming abortion on demand without apology, standing up for women's can lives. I, can I ask, time. do you have a question for our, our fine women here? Can you, I'm sorry, I do, just, I do but they I have to jet, They have to jet really fast at the end of this, so I just want to make sure that we have a chance to get a couple of questions in. Okay. In I really appreciate your passion on this, but I really want to make sure they have a chance to I will to ask. Okay, engage. let me. In the spirit of the film, I want to say that the Albuquerque, where two of the doctors work, is on November 9th facing a, a law that will be voted on in the city council to make 20-week ban on abortion. And I want people to know about that. And Stop Patriarchy is probably going to be mobilizing to go down there, stoppatriarchy.org. We are also going down to Mississippi, where the clinic is under siege in November. I really I have to ask so you to ask question, you questions, please. I know, but you know what? This matters. And I know you made a film because it matters, which is where I'm going with my question. Come 
on now, people. My question is, if you can actually bring us up to speed since the film, what is going on with the doctors and the laws on 20-week bans, which is spread, and the other part is among the different reactions among different generations, because we found a very, very big gap from women who remember before Roe v. Wade. So I'm just curious from the film so far. Absolutely. Excellent question. question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as you say, there is this ballot measure coming up in November in Albuquerque. It would be a 20-week ban. Everyone in the city is voting on it. It was just approved by the city council, five votes to four votes. So it's, it's incredibly disturbing. It's very frightening. That's coming up soon. Uh, Dr. Carhart is still practicing in Maryland, but really under siege. And Dr. Hearn is still practicing too. He's 76 now. Um, yeah, but he's just a trooper. Uh, as far as the differences between the different generations in this issue, we've noticed that too. That was one thing Martha and I talked about when we started the film because we were both under 30 then. I'm so ashamed I turned 30 two weeks ago, so I can't say that anymore. But we were under 30 and we were always talking about how it's so interesting that people who are our age tend to grow up taking a lot of these rights for granted. We've grown up, we weren't in the fight. Abortion was legal, contraception was legal, it was available to people who are privileged women in America like us who had sex education, who had access to contraception and birth control. We've always had that, and so there's a tendency we've noticed among younger women to, if someone needs an abortion, you hear, well, why wasn't she using birth control? It's her fault, you know, a lot of blaming going on there. And one thing we learned from watching this movie was how shocking it is that so many people in the country don't have that basic, comprehensive, age-appropriate sex education. They don't have access to contraception. They might not even know the most basic things about the signs of being pregnant. And they don't, as you see in the film, they don't have adults who they feel safe talking to. It's, it's very disturbing, and as we move forward, one thing that the doctors have told us themselves is that they're less worried about people coming to replace them in doing third trimester abortions, and they're more worried about access being cut off completely. And that's all about this, because it's one thing to, to know about birth control and contraception, but if you don't have access to it, and you can't afford it, then it, it doesn't really matter. So there is a disconnect there between the, the different generations, and we hope that, that this film will illuminate that a little more for people. Okay, I see a hand all the way back. Um, where's the mic? <laughs> Um, uh, first of all, great job, fantastic. Thank you for making this movie. Um, I have two questions. My first is, um, I was unclear when one of the doctors in Albuquerque talked about what, what, how could she say no to a woman based on her story. Um, so do any of the doctors deny um, women's requests based on something other than the safety of the procedure? I have another question, um, sorry to ask people the questions, but um, at the beginning the text said that these are the only four known doctors providing these, this service, and can you speak a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah, thank you for um, two interesting questions. Yeah, I mean, um, to answer the second one first, it's, yeah, we use the word known doctors because um, there are you know, we've heard of other doctors who will do, um, particularly in the case of, you know, if an OBGYN has a patient who, with a severe fetal anomaly, or the patient's going to die, or if the if the pregnancy continues, or there's some some very dire situation, some women are lucky enough to have an OBGYN who will do the abortion for them. Um, but these doctors are the only ones who are um, putting it out there that they're going to do this work and provide this service, and so. I think because of that, they attract a lot of women who don't really have any other options. Sometimes they're more low income, live in rural places, just don't have um, a doctor who could do the service for them. And then, to speak to the earlier question, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, each of the doctors really um, has their own sort of philosophy and rationale behind um, how they make these decisions. And, you know, for Dr. Carhart in Maryland, it's actually Legally there, he can only do abortions past 28 weeks, either for the health or life of the mother or for fetal anomalies. Um, so it's a little bit different, the law there, than in, than in New Mexico. But I think um, the other doctors, it really is just case by case. You know, it's, it's, it just depends on, um, they just see these incredibly desperate patients. And they, if you ask them this question, they would say the same thing. You know, it's just 
we just listen to each patient and try to te treat each patient as an individual and make a decision based on their individual circumstances because no two cases are, are quite alike. So that's what they would tell you. Great. Um, woman in the pink in the middle back there. Just want to try to get around the room. <laughs> Hi, I'm a medical student, and thank you so much for making this film. I found this film incredibly inspiring, but also very exciting because unfortunately it takes people with incredible um, sacrifices, very strong people, to um, be third-term providers. So I wanted to ask you guys, what do you see happening moving forward? Um, what is the next step for people watching or people in the healthcare industry or just in general? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, for us as filmmakers, the next step right now is is getting people who have different points of view to see the movie and talking about it with them. I mean, it's getting people into the theaters to see it, but it's also just talking about this more openly in general, because it, it seems that a lot of the time, this is an issue you don't want to broach a lot of the time because it feels like, oh, well, if she's anti-abortion, this is just going to be a butting heads thing and we're not going to get anywhere. But we feel like part of removing the shame and the stigma around this is just engaging people with it and just going there and you know staying away from those abstract philosophical debates about when does life begin that are questions that we can't resolve for anyone or with one film or in one conversation but talking about specific women and their situations and really delving into real life circumstances of people we see this as a conversation starter and we hope that the film is a frame for people thinking about their own understanding of abortion in a deeper, more complex way. And we feel like it has to radiate out from the film into your everyday interactions with people around you. Uh, that's one thing. No, I, I, I hope that um, the film will be seen by people on both sides. And I think as far as the future of this work, was that part of the question? It's sort of the future of this work. I. You know, the doctors always say, people are always very worried, of course, that these doctors are getting older, and if they retire, what's going to happen? And they're thrilled, of course, because the new doctor in Albuquerque is in her 30s, and she just finished being trained for a year, so she can really work on her own now um, as one of them. But, but they're never worried that there's not going to be enough medical young people to learn this and to, to do this work. They see a lot of passionate young medical students um, on a regular basis, but they're worried about it remaining legal, really. And and I think that's the biggest concern. So whenever they, if they were here, you know, it's like whenever people say, what can I do? They always say, well, just vote. Just call your legislators. Just make sure that, that we keep this legal and accessible. And get involved with NARAL. I mean, that's what we tell everyone, too, when we talk to NARAL, because they're doing such incredible activism in, on a state-by-state -state level. The situation in the landscape is so different in every state with these laws, and it's incredibly delicate, and NARAL just knows better than anyone what exactly is going on everywhere, so I would encourage all of you to also just get more involved with NARAL. Well, and you did a great job in the film demonstrating just watching um, Leroy and, and you know, travel across the state, across state lines to try to find another place. So you've done a great job of illustrating that in this film, I think. Um, I know you've had your hand up for a while. We, I'm sorry. Well, I don't mean to make you run. <laughs> I think you do need to wait. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the process of making the film. Uh, in particular, you know, how you decided to get the balance of the different people and getting everybody to cooperate or obviously they're passionate about the issue, but still getting yourself on camera and talking about it, it's very, there's a lot of delicate issues there. And also, um, you know, your own decisions to make this film, but, you know, how it evolved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Great well, so, um, so the two male doctors got on board very quickly. It was, it was surprising to us in a way. I mean, we sent them sort of packets of information outlining our vision for the film and they immediately said we'll come out and visit and you know Dr. Card as you can see in the film is very laid back, very warm. He just immediately he'd done public you know, he'd done interviews before, he felt like this was important, he wanted people to hear his story, so he wanted to be involved. Dr. Hearn on the other hand was kind of the opposite and he was, you know, before we actually went out and met him, he said well, nothing's going to change. Nobody wants to hear this story. I, you know, there's no reason for you to do this. But again, you know, he let us come out and, and at least talk to him. So, and as soon as we got out there, it was like night and day. I mean, he just like 
he immediately was saying, you know, we're going to help these young women as much as we can. I think part of it was just being being young and being women, and I think they had the sense that we weren't going to be an intrusion on the clinic. We were going to sort of fit right in, and we were very careful to say, you know, we're going to respect your security as much as possible. We're going to um, just try to be as unobtrusive, unobtrusive as possible. Um, and then the two female doctors actually took about a year to agree to be in the film. So we were going forward with the film without them for a long time. Um, and they at first had said to Lana, they said, no, we just don't. We, Dr. Tiller never did any press, so they just didn't feel like it was right. They felt like it's about the patient and not about me. So, um, but eventually, after some time, they eventually agreed to um, at least have us come out and visit. And we had a long dinner with um, the boys who owned that Albuquerque clinic and Dr. Susan Robinson. And we talked about, like, everything. I mean, we talked about, like, their work, but also, like, our love lives and had a couple bottles of wine. Offensive. And it was the charm <laughs> offensive, exactly. And um, by the end, Susan was like... I want to I wanted do this film, and Shelley got on board then too. And I, for them, I think it was really also seeing that this was a way to get this, the um, patient stories out there, that even if they felt like it wasn't about them, it, this was a way to, to explain why women seek third trimester abortion. So, yeah. And then, to then um, I guess the, the other two big things in the filmmaking were deciding how to treat the patients and how to treat the protesters. And with the patients, it was such an interesting learning process for us because we did a lot of test screenings. And with these women's stories, it's incredible how taken out of context, people can be incredibly judgmental of them. But what we ended up finding was successful in getting people to have more compassion for these women was beginning, first of all, by just delving into this ambiguous, very emotional case, the sobbing woman at the beginning. who You don't know why she's there. You don't know really what's happening. All you know is that she's conflicted about this. This is wrenching for her. It's not easy. And then going from there into the patient cases that were the easiest to understand at first, just to get people over that hump of third trimester abortion, that's terrifying. Starting with those fetal anomaly cases that almost anyone could identify with. And then as the film goes along, we gradually get and push the audience more and more into more complicated and grayer terrain, ending with that 16-year-old girl where even the counselor was saying, I don't know if you should do this. Uh, so that's just what we found worked the best with audiences and kind of expanded their understanding and put them in a place where they were noticing themselves judging the stories. There's one part of the film where the patient says she's not telling her family because they would all judge her. You know, you, you become aware of yourself and of what is your role in making judgments for these women? Because it's one thing to have an abstract argument, but it's another to tell a woman she can't do that, even though you don't know her in her situation. So that was what we did with the patients. And then with the protesters, we knew from the get-go that we didn't really want to have interviews with the protesters or anything like that, because we feel like their point of view is amply represented in the mainstream media and outside these clinics every day with their signs and with their trucks and what have you. So we thought, let's just represent the protesters as they are in the doctor's lives. They're this presence hovering in the background, they're a looming threat, but they're not directly interacting with the doctors very much, except in the case, it's more of Dr. Carhart with his storyline, they were more directly affecting his life. So that's how we decided to treat them. And when we did show them, we didn't want to make them look at these extreme cartoonish lunatics, because although a few of them are, most of them aren't. You know, so we wanted to let them sh to share the more reasonable points that they do have against late abortion, but really just minimize their presence overall because that reflects how they are in the doctor's lives. I know everyone has so many more questions, unfortunately, or rather fortunately, we have another showing here in a few minutes, so we are going to have to wrap up, and these two wonderful women are going to need to run to another event as well. Um, please join me in thanking them. Three things for the for the Week, particularly opening weekend. Opening weekend is critical, critical, critical. Tell everyone you know to see this film. Second, sign up out outside to hear more about what's happening with After Tiller and this incredible work. And you can also sign up to get involved with NARAL Pro Choice New York and be a part of that fight to make sure that, as uh, Leroy and in particular um, said, we need to make sure that this stays le legal. And we all need to be a part of that. So thank you so much for being here tonight.